take a second to welcome you again. Uh, I'm Susan Muller. You can see my picture on the screen. I'm the business development manager here at BuzzSumo. And I'm on the call with Steve Rayson, one of our founders and directors. And we're going to be talking with you today about, uh, about RAM, our process that we call Research, Amplify, and Monitor, and how to use RAM to rescue your content. Specifically, we're looking at how to prevent content fails before they start. Just a couple of housekeeping issues issues. The webinar today is going to be about 40, uh, 40 minutes, depending on the number of questions that you have. We would love it as we're talking. If you have questions, just go ahead and enter them into the question box. And we'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation and keep an eye on things that, that you're thinking about. We'd love to really make this time an interactive one. So if there's something that is on your mind that you would like to talk about, uh, just jump in, enter the questions, and and we'll take those as we go. We're going to begin by looking at the results of an analysis that Steve has done of over 1 million articles and then turn our attention to how, um, how a concerted process of research, amplification, and monitoring can actually help your content. So let me go ahead and turn this over to Steve Rayson. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as uh, Susan said, um, if you have questions, it's very much your session. So if you have questions, do just ask them away and we'll try our best to answer them. So whilst we've got slides, we're really keen to just engage with you uh, this afternoon. So just check I've got control here. Uh, okay, let's just check. I don't think I have control. Let me just try. I can't seem to move it forward, Susan. So let me... Okay, let me try one more time. It's Sorry about this. People were just yeah, there you <laughs> go. running the slides, so <laughs> just passing control over to me. So um, what I, I wanted to do was just talk about we did a bit of work this week about content shock and about why content fails. So we thought it'd just be worth just recapping some of the lessons from some of the research we've done this year. So uh, we've done a lot of different pieces of research, but one was with Moz where we looked at a million articles, and I'm going to show you a few different pieces uh, this week. So. When we looked at the one million pieces of content, we looked at it for topics and we looked at it for specific domains. So you're like your own website, um, for example, New York Times or BuzzFeed, etc. And we expected to see something that looked a bit like this. So you know, you'd have some content on your website that does quite well, some content that probably doesn't do quite so well, and, and sort of some average content in the middle. And so when we looked at content and how it performs, we expected to see something broadly of this shape. Um, but unfortunately, when we actually then did the analysis, that isn't what we found at all, really. Um, what we found, um, I don't know if you're moving on to the next slide, because okay. I don't have control there. Um, this is what we found, which is um, uh, basically a really big skew of content, so that we found that and this happened for both topics and for specific sites, such as whether we're talking about the New York Times here or BuzzFeed, we found that the vast majority of content actually got very few shares and very few links, got even less links than it got shares. But it, it was consistent. This shape of the content performance was consistent. Let's say whether we looked at a very specific domain, whether it was a news domain, whether it was a B2B marketing site, uh, whether it was about a topic, we found this consistent skew where you've got some very high performing content on that right hand edge, it stops there at a thousand shares, but actually some went up to a hundred thousand shares. Um, but the overwhelming majority of content um, actually got very few shares. So we found this skew which we were interested to explore uh, and look at. Um, Thank you. Sorry, I got muted there for a second. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you, you can see here what we found in terms of the actuals. We took 100,000 of those posts, you know, just random posts. Average shares 257, but they were skewed by that distribution. You know, those ones that are getting 100,000 posts, those ones that we look at in Envy. Um, a lot of them were getting huge numbers of uh, shares. Whereas actually, if we looked at the medium, which is the 50% mark, 50% of posts were getting eight shares or less. So it, it surprised us at how low that was. Um, and when we looked at links, it was even worse. And 50% got zero links. Um, so what surprised us was just how little engagement a lot of the content got, really. And so we tried to understand why it was failing and then what we could do about it. And Susan will take you through some of those things a little bit later. Um, but if we just move on to the next slide, Susan.
Sorry, when I get moved on the slide, I seem to be losing my audio, but um, I apologize for this. Um, so in terms of that, what we were finding, we it wasn't just our research that found this. So this is a piece of research from, from Track Maven. Um, they looked at 8,000 brands and found that over the last year or so, they were increasing their content production. But actually, the amount of engagement they were getting was lower. So actually, it's not just that it was a poor picture, it was actually getting uh, a lot worse, actually, in terms of people increasing the amount of content. But actually, the average engagement per post seemed to be going down. So actually, things seem to be getting more difficult. And if we just click and bring up the next image, Susan, underneath there, um, what they found was very similar to our findings, actually very close to our findings, although they looked at a completely different sort of content. They found that 43% of professionally marketed blog posts, these are produced by brands, actually got less than 10 interactions. So whilst we all look on with envy at these ones that get thousands of posts, actually there's a huge chunk of content that really isn't performing very well. And that's what we were trying to understand is, you know, why, why didn't this perform particularly well? And is it really about something called content shock? I mean, Mark Schaefer's written a lot about the fact that there's just simply so much content now that it, it, there's this thing called content shock. So that um, basically it, we've all competing for so much uh, time of people's time that, you know, invariably if the amount of content goes up and goes up, we're all going to compete for it and we'll probably get less on average each. Um, and so he argues there's content shock, but but Joe Polizzi, if we move to the next slide, has basically taken a different tack. And Joe is a really experienced guy, runs the Content Marketing Institute, and his view is actually there isn't really going to be content shock. And he gives sort of five reasons for it, and I'm going to run through these. So he starts by saying, well, okay, there's a lot of content. Sorry, can we move back to the previous slide? Um, so he's saying, um, so basically he's saying, you know, con content makes people feel very empowered and enthusiastic. So it's not a problem that there's lots of content. And I think that's right. To individuals, there's not a problem. We might feel a bit, how do we keep up with all the content and those sorts of things. But generally, it gives us more choice. We can choose what we look at and those sorts of things. It makes us empowered. But if you look at it from the point of view of a content marketer, it's, it's a lot, lot harder because um, actually people can choose not to see your content and there's lots of other things. That so, so whilst I think the first point is right, actually, um, in reality for us as content marketers, it gets a little bit harder because they've got more choice. Joe also says that actually if you focus on in on your audience, and I think he's right about this, if you really focus in on a niche audience, then content shock is less relevant because even in a niche audience, you've got, you've got a better chance of actually engaging your audience. You've got a better chance of working out what they want and making sure that your content's seen. So he's arguing that actually yeah, maybe there's a lot of content overall, but in your space, the more you focus on your audience and a niche audience, the better chance you've got. And I think in general that's true, but I think there's still an issue about content shock. And if we move on to the, the next slide, sorry that I have to talk them through. This is one that Joe gives as an example. In, in the post he wrote about why there won't be content shock, he actually uses this example of saying, actually, if you're interested in ferrets and you're writing about ferrets, then maybe content shock doesn't matter so much because actually it's a very niche area. So, and I thought, well, that's a fair enough point. So I, I went to Google and then searched for ferret. And if I can bring up the next image and then just click to see, bring up the red line, um, you can see that there are actually 21 million articles about ferrets. <laughs> so, even in a niche area, there's a huge amount of content. So it seems to me that we have got to think about what we're doing with our content because even in a niche area, there's a lot of content for us to compete with. Um, and if we click on to go through Joe's other arguments, um, he's also saying content shock is not a problem because people have filters. And so people can filter our content easily. So it doesn't matter that there's lots of it because they're filtered down what they want. And again, at one level, I think that's true. People do have better filters for searching and uh, for finding what they want. But I think it raises some real questions for us. So if we, if we just bring up the next slide, it's really about social as a filter. This is from Shiraholic. I'm sure any of you who listened to my webinars may have seen this slide before, so I apologize. But Shiraholic did this work about you know where do people come from when they visit websites? And they track about 350,000 websites. And they found last year that people coming from social overtook the number of people coming from search. And so it seems to me that Joe's right about people filtering, but are people using social to filter? Um, and it would seem they are studies of millennials, et cetera, how they get news and, and other sorts of content is increasingly they're finding it through Facebook, they're finding it through other social feeds. And rather than going to Google and searching, 
they're clicking on an article that somebody shared, they're reading it, they're going back to their social feed. And I think we can all reflect on how do we do it. Do we do more Google searches than we used to, or do we click on articles that we see that fellow professionals share on social? And there does seem to be quite a lot of evidence, I think, that people are visiting sites through social. So social is becoming quite an important filter, and that to me means that if you're going to produce content, you need to get your content in that filter. So you, you want your content to be in those social streams, and that probably means you need to get it shared in those streams, or at the very least you're going to have to pay to play, and you need paid promotion to get into those streams. And that, that might increasingly be the case in some of the big networks like Facebook. And if we click on um, one of the key uh, things I wanted to look at in the filter, sorry, go back one. Um, is the importance of Facebook. So I'm interested in this because lots of B2B people say to me, Facebook's not that relevant. But if this graph is anywhere near right, I mean, what Cheryl Hollick is saying, and actually Parsley came up with an even higher figure in their research. Parsley came out and said they thought over 30% of traffic now across the whole of the web was driven by Facebook, which is huge. It's a danger for all of us that Facebook becomes the web if it becomes that big. Um, but there's a real issue, I think, about if, if Facebook's driving that much traffic, that seems to be a filter we have to be in. So if people are visiting a lot of traffic from Facebook, how do we actually get into those feeds and get people sharing us? So I think there's an interesting issue there. And sorry, just to move on to the next slide there. Um, Jim makes two further points, really. One is that we're not done innovating, so it's not a problem because we're experimenting with native advertising and that will improve and we'll get to our audience that way. And his really big argument is that great content rises to the top. So if you produce fantastic content, it will rise to the top anyway and people will find it. And I'm not sure whether that's the case any longer. And if we just click to the next slide, um, this is a quote from Mark Schaefer, and he takes a quite a different view. So Mark's view is that the idea that great content rises to the top is over. So his view is that it's not the content itself which is so important these days. Actually, what's equally important is amplification in Mark's view. So he's saying, well, you really need to ignite your content, you need to amplify it. And I think Mark's even gone as far as saying, actually, amplification could be more important than uh, the content itself, which I think would be a sad day for all of us if that was the case. Um, but he's really saying that you know it may be those people who are best at amplification, if you can get out to the influencers, or those people who have simply got really deep pockets and can advertise, they'll get their content visible amongst all these millions and millions of other pieces of content out there. And so in his view, it could be that amplification is actually becoming at least as important as the content itself. And so it's something that we would need to think about before we start um, on our process of creating content, but actually thinking about how it might be amplified as well. So Yes, yeah, so some, some interesting thoughts there, I think, from, from Joe about content shock and others about saying, well, maybe content shock does exist. But I think what we can see is it's getting difficult. So if we just click onto the next line, um, however we agree or disagree about this, it does seem to be getting harder to drive social and social traffic. Um, this was a really transparent post by Kevin at Buffer. Those guys are so open about what they're doing. And a very honest post saying, look, we lost nearly half our social traffic in the last 12 months. So they're just admitting it's getting a bit tougher for them and they're trying to understand why. And so that intrigued me. So I went and had a look at their social shares. And if we just move to the, the next slide, all I did was look at the shares per article published across different sites. I did it for lots of different sites. And we can see even for the big sites here, so Buffer's a big site, Copy Blogger, Social Media Examiner, these are sites of people who get the content right, really. They generally produce good quality content. They have big audiences. But even their average shares per piece of content has been falling, which is potentially worrying for the rest of us because we may not have such a big audience. So if they're struggling to get the average shares per post up, uh, what does that mean for us? And so I think whether you agree or don't agree with content shock, it does seem to me that it is getting harder. Um, we always knew that content marketing wasn't as easy as some people said. You just publish stuff out there and it'll get found and get shared. I think there are some big questions now about... I think it's still a great opportunity. I think content marketing definitely works, but I think you have to think a lot about improving your odds. If there's a lot of content out there, how do you improve your odds? And so that's what Susan's now going to talk about. It's about some of our ideas of things you can do to actually improve your odds in that world where there is, I think, quite a lot of content shock and I think where things are actually quite tough to reach your audience. And even if you have a, a very narrow audience like Ferrets, 
you're still competing with 21 million pieces of content, so you've still got a task on your hands. So um, um, I'll pass over to Susan and, and pick up. Um, I don't have any questions first, Susan, before we jump to the next bit. So, um, yeah, one question so far, Steve, and this is from John. Uh, thanks for, for posting questions. Are there any considerations for annual cycles, uh, John is asking? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I said there are. I mean, there are there are natural cycles for some types of content, um, but um, yeah, but beyond that, I think whilst there are, I mean, we've just been looking at trends, and we are finding they're moving year on year. Um, so I suppose there will be peaks for particular types of content. Um, or I did when I looked at that, that recent data was I just pulled 11 months of data because what I had to hand for the various sites. Um, I didn't see much there in the way of cyclical trends. I generally saw a, a gradual decline in the average shares per post, which is what I saw there. But um, I don't know, John, that covers the point, but happy to pick up any more sort of detailed question around that. But thanks, Susan. I'll pass over to you now and I'll take sure. questions. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think when we hear all this news about the future of content marketing and content shock, you know, our, sometimes our first response can be a little bit more fearful. But um, I like Eric Ng's advice when he says, don't fear the glut of content. And at BuzzSumo, we we really have that that hopeful attitude of we, we don't need to fear the glut of content, but we do need to pay attention to some important processes and we have we've been uh, referring to them as the RAM process research amplification and monitoring of content and we think that that with uh, with the RAM process you really are going to be able to continue to push your content to the top and experience success in in the content marketing process so when we talk about RAM we're referring to three specific tasks the first is research and the research that we're mostly focused on is research about your audience you know, if you are in the ferret world, you need to know a lot about people who are into ferrets. Um, you need to know questions that they're being asked. You need to know what content is resonating with them. You need to know about current trends that your audience is paying attention to, as well as the, the best formats for content, the most popular authors. And we also think it's a great idea to just take a look at what your competitors are doing. You know, in, in most industries, you're not alone. And so having a clear picture of the types of strategies that your competitors are using and how they're succeeding or failing can be a great way to inform your content process. The next step that we want to pay careful attention to is amplifying content. And this is what Steve was referring to and what Mark Schaefer has been kind of beating a drum on is that it's it's really important that we give a lot of time and attention to amplifying content. And by that, we mean looking at like Steve has done with this research, the links and shares for content in your industry, looking at what does drive links and shares, um, looking at the role of paid advertising. Uh, we also think it's great to just be asking, okay, who is amplifying content? Who is sharing content? Whose audience is engaged with their content in a way that, that really pushes content forward? Another thing to keep in mind is who are the influencers and how can I reach out to them? And a, you, another couple things that you want to think about are, are your employees something that you can leverage as advocates for your brand that might help to amplify your content? And then again, Facebook is sort of the big blue cloud out there. Um, how, what is the role of Facebook and how can we use it in amplifying content? And then the third process is monitoring. And that just means paying attention to what's trending, paying attention to what's current, uh, looking for content benchmarks, and then using alerts to track a lot of these features, new mentions, new links, um, and, and new publications from websites in your space. So this is how we envision the process uh, with research feeding into amplifying, feeding into monitoring, and then repeating itself. Um, so it's not, in our minds, a one shot thing. You know, you set aside uh, the first Monday in January after you're back to work, you do your research amplification and monitoring and you're done. No, we see it as an ongoing process that you repeat for um, for all of your content. And we believe really that, that the battle for engagement can be won or lost at the research stage before any content is ever written. You know, it's like, I don't know if any of you guys were like this as a kid, but I love to get a fresh new notebook and just start writing in it. <laughs> um, but with our content marketing, uh, we want to take a step back. And before we start that writing or creating, we want to do our homework. And specifically, the things we need to know are about our audience. We want to really understand 
the audience that we're trying to reach with our content. We want to know what questions are they asking? What's really resonating with them? And what do they share? So as you're looking at your audience, there are a couple of things that you're going to want to pay attention to. You're going to want to look for headlines that people seem to respond to, content formats, I'm sorry, content formats and themes that, that really resonate with people. Uh, you might want to pay a close, a close attention to content that is good but out of date or content that is good but lacks visuals. Also, you can look for simple articles that could be deepened. And with all of these things, you want to look for overlap with the expertise that you bring to the table. So here are a couple ways that you can do that. I would begin the process just by looking for the most shared content from your site. Um, the people who are already sharing from your site are interested in what you're doing, so it's good to see what's appealing to them. This is a search that I did within BuzzSumo's most shared section just for the most shared content from buzzsumo.com. These were the top uh, five articles from the last year. And as you can see, I just highlighted that I really do think there are some themes that you can identify here. Uh, shares and shares are in the first piece, amplification in the second, links and shares in the third, tips in the fourth, and again, back to shares um, on the fifth piece. So we definitely have people who are interested in links and shares and who are interested in tips and in how to amplify their content. The next step could be to just look and see what your audience likes to share. So you can begin by entering industry keywords into a search in BuzzSumo, and we'll pull up a list for you of the most shared content on that topic. And so you can identify themes within that and see how people are approaching the topic and what, what angles are really resonating with your audience. I think it's also a great idea to ask yourself what you can learn from your competitors and from industry leaders in your space. You know, if you have been part of a, a BuzzSumo demo, you've probably seen this search before, but I think it is such a great picture of the value of spending some time on research. This is a search for the most shared quiz from BuzzFeed. And if you look at it, I've just got the top four responses here, but actually the top six responses um, in terms of the most shared quizzes all have the same headline formula. The hardest friends quiz, the hardest National Lampoon's Christmas vacation quiz, the hardest SpongeBob quiz. And it's not limited to just the top six results. There are even more throughout the top 40. And I think the most fascinating bit to me is that if you look at the dates of those content pieces, the oldest one in the top 40 that I've seen is from October of 2014. But even just looking at this slide, you can see that there's one from July 20th of this year. So this is a case where BuzzSumo, or no, I'm sorry, where BuzzFeed has identified a successful content formula, and they've been able to generate a high number of social shares for eight solid months using that formula. Now, here's another uh, little way that you can, can find the formats that are working in terms of what's appealing to your audience. In BuzzSumo, we offer what we call content analysis reports. And those reports give you a quick view of the types of content that your audience is responding to most. So what you can see here in the red is a content type section of an analysis report. And it's just showing you that for this site, list posts, why posts, and how articles are performing far are better than all other content combined. So if this is your site, you know that what your audience is really interested in is lists, whys, and how articles. So that's the kind of content that you want to provide for them because you know it's popular with them. The other thing that you want to take in consideration is the length of content. So definitely in our research, we've seen that content length makes a huge difference. If you'll look at this, you'll see that do a referring domain leaks, le sorry, <laughs> referring domain links are peaking at the three to 10,000 word link. So really long content is performing best in terms of referring domain links. In terms of social shares, that peaks at the two to 3,000 word limit with, uh, with the highest uh, numbers at the highest median at 578. So you want to take into consideration the length of your content, and BuzzSumo can help to make that a little bit easier with our content analysis reports. We show you average shares by content length. And again, for this site, it's bearing out the research from earlier that the longer form content is being shared more often than others. Now, another thing that you can ask yourself is, can you find a niche for your content? And I think that's um, one thing that Steve was referring to earlier. Eric Ng says this, there 
are still tons of markets where no one has started to do a really good job at it. Jump in now and claim that early mover advantage. Uh, you know, we do a lot of content analysis and research at BuzzSumo, and this is definitely something that we've seen borne out. You know, I'll, I'll do a lot of reports on different industries, and a lot of times the industries really seem to be very full of great content. The average share numbers are high, uh, but then every so often we stumble onto one where maybe the average shares are under 100 and there are only 3,000 articles for the whole year. Um, so you definitely want to take into consideration whether or not you can work in a niche market. And I wanted to just give you a couple of practical ideas on how you can identify those. Um, one thing that I've been experimenting with a lot lately is using Pinterest guided search. So if you look at the top of the slide, that's what you'll see where the, where the words are on the, the, col the colored um, buttons are on the black background. I, I've entered content marketing into a Pinterest search. And then once you enter a search term, you just click enter. And what Pinterest does is it pulls together a list of words that people are also searching for in connection with your search terms. Now, this is not predictive. They're not guessing at what people are searching for. They're actually telling you what they're searching for. So what I did was I just started combining some of those words. So underneath it, you'll see my Google search for content marketing funnel, and that got almost 2 million results. But I added another word, so I was going for an even longer tail keyword, visual content marketing funnel, and that got less than a half a million results. I mean, it's still a lot, but comparatively, I'm, I'm using this insight from Pinterest and Google to hopefully identify markets that are less served and where I might be able to provide some really great content. Now, we also suggest, you know, really finding the questions that, that your target audience is answering um, or is, is asking. A couple ways to do that are beginning with Quora. You can search the site to see the questions that are related to your topic and make note of the ones that get the most upvotes. Uh, that's a, a good way to source question ideas. You also need to get very friendly with the customer service side of your business and really find out what types of things are people asking us about our product, about our industry. Find out what is on people's minds by taking a look at the questions that they send into you. You can also get valuable information from forums, from blog comments. You know, if you post a blog and then just forget about it, don't do that anymore. Um, look at those comments, pay attention to them, and see if you can identify what people are thinking about by looking at those. And also pay attention to what is coming up in your social media streams. What are the kinds of things that people are talking about in, in your social media networks? Once you've identified the questions, then your task is straightforward. Be the best answer. That's from Lee Odin. And I think it's a great way to look at what you want to do. You know, you may find a lot of answers out there for how to train your ferret, um, if we want to go back to the ferret example. Uh, but what you want to provide is the best answer. So think about how you, what you have to contribute and how you can improve on, on anything that already exists in your content area. If I can add on that, Susan, because I think that's a really important one, which is when you're looking for content opportunities in your research is, I think a, a number of people have identified the fact that people share the very best answers. So they might share the top two or three posts and the rest just disappear and don't get very much coverage at all. And it's a bit like going and visit those tall buildings and cities. People always go and visit the tallest buildings, not the fifth or sixth <laughs> tallest building. And um, and I think that's the, so when you look at content opportunities, there are already two or three really good ones. Maybe you look somewhere else, unless you can improve on it. And it seems to me one of your tasks is, can we be better than those articles there? Can we provide something which is more comprehensive, better visuals, better practical how-to guides or something? But when we're looking at what's working, can we be better? Because if you can be the sixth best, that, that's really quite poor because um, it may seem good, but in reality you'll drop away in terms of traffic. So I think when you're looking for those opportunities, I think Lee's advice here is, is can you be the best answer? Do you have the best specialists, the best case studies? Mm -hmm. Where can you actually provide the very best answer? So I think it's, it's definitely worth thinking about when you've, you're finishing off this research stage. That's a great point. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for that. Uh, you know, at the beginning of my section, I was talking about content weak spots that you could look for. You could look for things that are out of date, that are uh, maybe a good idea, but not very developed. You can look at things that are possibly lacking a visual element. So when you think about creating content that's going to be the best answer, you want to kind of apply those principles in reverse and ask yourself, okay, is what I'm about to create going to be powerful visually? Is it going to 
be in depth? Um, is it going to be evergreen? So you want to look at your content. And I think one of the ways you can be one of the best is by making sure that you're not falling into the pitfalls that you're looking for in other people's content. Yeah, one of the questions just come through from, from Karen, thank you Karen for the question, is about, you know, opinion about newsletters and can you use newsletters to break through. I think you can, because I think content marketing to me is about building your audience uh, and I think building an audience takes time and I think if you're going to do a newsletter, I think you have to be able to commit to it. So if it's a monthly or a weekly or whatever it happens to be, I think consistency and regularity of writing about the very same specifics of the topics so you can build the audience. To me, it's all about building the audience, which you can build trust with and sell to um, over time. So in terms of building an audience, I think newsletters can be good ways of doing that. I think they have to be very focused. And I think to me, a newsletter that's going to build an audience, just my personal view on this is it has to be very uh, practical in terms of being helpful, providing value, maybe through a, a later story, uh, good case studies, practical how-to advice. It should not sell, because I, I don't know about you, but I just don't really read newsletters that start to try and sell me something. It's, if it provides a short number of articles which are very practical and support me, then I, I start to, to trust it over time. And um, So I think they can be worth cutting through the clutter, but I think the, the the concept is thinking mind you're building an audience and so and I think it's true for any newspaper is that they build an audience over time through consistency people know what to expect and uh, so I think they can work I just think they're quite a lot of work and you've got to think about you know what you can deliver and make them not salesy would be my view. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Um, Viraj is asking, um, he says, I'm into news and journalism. How can I leverage um, RAM into it? And I think it'd be great to know a little bit more about the types of projects that you're doing, but I think research is fundamental to good journalism. Um, you need to be aware of what's happening. And I think the more you dig into a content area, the better you able, the better able you are to kind of spot what is unique, what is interesting, what is new. And so I think jumping into into journalism and writing content that has a news where you know a news focus without kind of knowing what's actually out there in the field already is is not such a great idea I'd be happy to know a little bit more though about the specific types of projects that you're looking at um, and one thing that I think you're going to want to do too, you've added about thinking about the new, the latest news coverage, is you're going to need a consistent way to monitor the news. So let's move on a little bit into the process, and then we'll circle back to the monitoring part. Um, we've talked about researching content, and I want to just talk a little bit now about amplifying content. Before you create your content, you need to understand how it will be amplified. I just want to let that sit there for a second. Before you create your content, you need to understand how it will be amplified. I think this so goes um, maybe against the, the, the grain a little bit because we begin to think about a content idea. We're really excited about it, and we want to just get started making that content, and then we'll deal with the amplifying when we get there. Um, well, what we're looking at a lot lately is how to build amplifying into the creation process and considering before you start, who's going to share this content, who's going to link to it, and why. With BuzzDemo, we have a couple of different resources that you can use to identify people who, who might be influencers or amplifiers that you could work with. Uh, the first you'll see in the, the long um, horizontal box is just finding the people who shared a specific content piece in their Twitter feed. If you have identified a piece of content and you know it has overlap with the type that you're going to create, you can find people who shared it and hopefully work with them. You can find uh, people who are the top authors in their content area using BuzzSumo, people who are consistently publishing on a topic and consistently getting a lot of social shares are definitely influencers. They're amplifying a content message. We can also help you find the top domains on all networks. So if you are researching a content area, you can do some analysis reports with, and, and determine which are the, the domains that people share from most often. And then you can also identify influencers on Twitter by searching for people who are interested in similar topics to your content area. And I think, you know, 
kind of disciplining yourself to do this from the beginning is is a good strategy. Uh, and sometimes it's not even that difficult. It's just a, a mindset change. A mindset change. Recently, I was working on a blog post and I was uncovering some different articles that I liked as I was researching the topic. And I could have just easily quoted those people and attributed it to them and moved on. But I decided to go ahead and take another step and instead of just quoting them, actually reach out to them, tell them what I was doing, ask if they'd like to weigh in on the topic. It wasn't so much that I that I needed um, needed them to contribute content. I needed the content, but I could have gotten it via, you know, just just pulling something out of a post and attributing it to them. But it was a much more valuable process to actually work with them in the creation of the content. You know, you always learn something when you do that. You become better at what you do. And you also then are kind of accessing someone else's audience. And that's exactly what happened with the content piece I was creating. The people who were involved in helping with that project shared it with their audiences. So I think just kind of changing our minds to think we're not going to amplify at the end, we're going to amplify before, during, and after we create content is really significant. This is just a little bit of our research on how uh, getting influencers to share your content can really uh, drive social shares and and double and quadruple your results. This is showing that uh, you would get uh, 706 shares with no uh, with no influencers amplifying your content, but that goes up to almost uh, well more than 2,500 shares if you have five influencers who are sharing your content. So anytime you want to just press send without giving ampl amplification a thought, go ahead and think about this post. And again, let's hear from Mark Schaefer on this, who says we're in an era where advertising promotion and distribution strategies may eclipse the importance of the content content itself. Definitely a very radical perspective. And, uh, you know, I think that for us, we want to say create, rate, create great content, but do it in conjunction with great, great promotion and distribution. So the and final the one thing I've mm -hmm. just, sorry, Susan, I just had the one thing, because so, I think people miss this a lot. And that's about, you mentioned it earlier, which is about employee advocacy. Mm -hmm. I suppose what I was disappointed by when I saw how low lots of people's shares were and people saying that uh, we only had six shares or 10 shares is that meant their own staff weren't sharing the content and I think you know most organizations would have you know six or more staff you think if you write something and even your own staff aren't sharing it why would other people share it if your own employees aren't interested in sharing your content why would necessarily other people so I think I do think you have to think about employee advocacy as well I mean I wouldn't overemphasize it but I think you know, if you're getting quite low shares if you can get 10 of your staff to share it amongst their friends and they've really got people with similar professional interests in mind and add to their networks that all helps the amplification. So I, I wouldn't ignore the, the potential you've got even from your own employees of, of helping them helping sort of ignite your content and starting to get it moved through social networks. So I would just think about employee advocacy to help amplify content as well. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. I um I wanted to also let you know that we did a webinar recently just about influencer outreach and covered some specific topics, including, you know, just being sure that you're building relationships with influencers. That's before the content is even created. So I'm going to include a link to that webinar when I send the link to, to this webinar as well. So you'll have access to that. Um, we're happy to share our thoughts on that process. And I think the other thing that you can think about with amplification is to taking content assets and making sure that you are leveraging them into all of your social channels. So if you have created a webinar, for example, using it as a slide deck, that's a great way to kind of amplify that message by simply uh, tailoring it to different learning styles and different social networks. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, influencer outreach is part of it. Um, employees are part of it. And then just spreading your content into different um, related assets is another great part of the amplification process. So we'll move on now to the monitoring um, section of our process. And, you know, I think what what I don't want to, to give you the idea of is that, that monitoring is just kind of the last thing you do. And we threw it in there because we wanted to have a, a one syllable, three letter word acronym. Totally did not. Um, monitoring fuels the entire process. So if, you know, watching, if you think of kind of the eyes in the sky, looking at what's happening, that's what the monitoring process is. And it can definitely help to make your content more relevant, to uh, work with your budget, to identify your audience. Monitoring helps with everything. 
So one of the things, and I think this is to Viraj's point about using research in, in journalism, is just knowing what is engaging your audience right now. What are people caring about? What are they thinking about? Um, so this is an example of a trending dashboard from BuzzSumo. And what this does is just pulls together content from all across the web and it gives you a trending score that will tell you how quickly people are sharing the content. Uh, we allow you to create custom dashboards for topics that are of interest to you. So you can keep an eye on what's trending everywhere and you can also keep an eye on what is trending in your own topic area. It's also a good idea to set some alerts for these types of things. I'm a fan of automating, so I don't have to remember all of these little tasks that I need to do all the time. Uh, you can set content alerts. With BuzzSumo, we have a couple of different options. You can monitor for several different types of search terms. Brand mentions, key competitor mentions, and keyword mentions are all search term based. And we will let you know anytime your brand is mentioned, anytime your competitor is mentioned, anytime your keyword is mentioned. It's great to be able to be one of the first to know about the mentions of different things, you can jump in and uh, contribute to those conversations. You can also set up alerts for backlinks. Uh, earlier, we talked about the importance of monitoring comments. You can, if you find an interesting post, set an alert for a backlink to that post. And if you publish content, you can set an alert for backlinks to your own content. That way you'll know if there's a conversation swirling around something that you or one of your colleagues just wrote. And with the, with the BuzzSumo alerts process, we also give you a way to monitor mentions of your brand, mentions of competitors' brands historically over time. So you can see when you've had more mentions, when you've had less. And then you can compare that to the mentions of your competitors' brands as well. Um, and if you do find places where they've really peaked, like this one on October 30th, there was a, a peak for TrackMaven, one of the other sites that I monitor. I can go back and see, okay, so what was happening there? You know, who was mentioning them? And I can use that to fuel the research for my next uh, my next project. If I find that they were being mentioned somewhere, I can possibly collaborate on content with someone at that source. So that's um that's the end of our thoughts on um well at least the end of our thoughts that that we're going to go over today. <laughs> we haven't yet reached an end of our thoughts on researching, amplifying, and monitoring content. And I think there are a couple more questions. So Steve and I will turn our attention to those. Yeah. I can pick up a few of those. I mean, and one that um, uh, Vera just asking about the best time, uh, what sort of time frames to look for for trending topics. One of the things I'd say is that it, is that shares happen very quickly in my experience. And so when we've been tracking, we tend to find that 90% of the shares take place really in the first three days um, for a particular topic, and then it tails off. I mean, it can change a little bit, but typically we find shares explode very fast over a three or so day period and then tail off, whereas links build a lot slower over time. And one of my tips really would be sometimes I think people see something which is really trending. They write a, a tweet about it, for example, or try to engage in it, but then they schedule it in a tool like a Buffer or Hootsuite and it goes out, they, they add it to their queue, and it goes out in three days' time. And I think often people simply miss the moment. I mean, I think... I think when you're talking about social sharing, it's very much of the moment. It's very much people engaged at the time, and we see that activity. And I think it's the same if you write about something. So I don't know, maybe you're writing an article about Twitter moving from favorites to, to hearts or whatever it happens to be. That was really popular a week ago, um, but it's probably less popular now because people might even be bored of the number of articles that were written at the time. So if you're going to write about something newsy, um, as we're just talking about, then you've got to act very quickly. And we know that one of our clients, one of the big publishers, um, they use our trending dashboard and look at what's trending in the last two hours. And if they see something trending in the last two hours, they decide to write a post about it there and then and engage in the conversation. And I think that's right if you're looking to engage with a lot of social sharing is you've got to be very quick. So to me, that monitoring is really important because I always say to people, you know, that the trend is your friend. As long as you're in there early enough, um, then it's OK. And if you get there too late, you're, you're left sort of dancing on your own on the dance floor there. So you've really got to be monitoring. Um, and I think as a content marketer, you have a responsibility to to understand what's trending in your particular space. So, um, yeah, monitoring to me is so important, but particularly if you want to engage in those newsy stories. Also, if you're writing something that's longer, more evergreen, that's fine. You can take more time about that. There'll always be interest in, in a more evergreen topic. But if you're writing about something newsy, such as a change in Twitter or a change in the way something's happening or a new research report, 
believe me, a lot of people want to get there, and you want to get there quite quickly. Um, otherwise, if you're the tenth post about Twitter's little love arts, you know, unless you're adding something completely different or a new perspective, people will probably just skip over that. Okay, I know about that. So, and you can plan in advance for that as well. We know next week Twitter are turning off share counts next Friday. So if you have a share count button, it's very likely to be turned off next Friday when Twitter closes that down. So we've written an article already. I, can, I don't think I've revealed too much. We've already written a blog post, which should be going out next Wednesday about that, which is two days before it goes off to try and pick up on that trend. So Twitter share counts are getting turned off on Friday. A lot of people we suspect don't know about that. They'll certainly start to find out about it next week, and so we want to be ahead of that trend. So I think you've got to be doing things like that to make sure that you're you're in there at the right time. And if you're not, then look at something else. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, you know, in conjunction with the the trending content, the content alerts are a great way to go too. I was doing some research, and just uh, for a celebrity news publication. And I was noticing that in our alerts and, you know, I was I was doing things like Justin Bieber, the Kardashians. I was finding alerts that mentioned names and story ideas, sometimes four and five hours before they showed up on some of the major news publications. So if I were I used to work in journalism, if I were doing it now, I would have alerts set for the different topics that that I cover. And, um, you know, I would be kind of kind of watching for mentions of topics that are of interest to me in that alerts feed because you can pick up some really good things and they're not coming from from necessarily mainstream news sources first they're coming from from all over the web um, I think, too, if you can kind of think through what your rapid response plan would be as a content marketer, uh, it, you know, it's one thing to kind of know, OK, if something trends in this topic, I'm going to jump on it. Um, and that's that's a good first step. But I would go ahead and think through and in what way could I offer something to a conversation about A, B, C and D and, uh, you know, maybe do some contingency planning based on what your content response would be in, in certain scenarios. I think anytime speed is the key, having a plan in place can can really help. So I would I would plan on, you know, a little bit of contingency planning for trending topics. Great, other good points. Right, I think we're reaching the end. Just checking if there are any more questions coming through. Uh, someone's asked if it's being recorded, and uh, yes, um, sorry, oh yeah, where can we see it? We we will um, put it up on our YouTube channel. We have a, a BuzzSumo YouTube channel, and we put up our various webinar recordings there, so uh, it will um, be put up there as well. You'll also get an email with the link to the recording. I'm going to send that out on Monday. It generally takes about a day to get the, the video converted to the right format. So um, so we'll do that. You'll get a, a link in your mailbox on Monday. I'm also going to send along a link to our influencer outreach. And, um, and Eileen is asking about how Twitter turning off their share counts will impact BuzzSumo or not at all. Um, Eileen, we anticipate it being, um, we've been working on, on our plan and feel quite confident that we're going to be able to provide the most, um, the most useful information about Twitter share counts to our customers. Um, basically, we have acquired a new source of the data and are doing some uh, in-house proprietary calculations with that that's going to allow us to give, um, to give share counts for Twitter yeah, content. I can jump in and add to that as well. I mean, you're probably aware, Leanne, everybody else here, that Twitter are turning off the API that gives share counts. Um, partly it's expensive to maintain, and they've had a few issues with it. So um, you can still get the data, but you now have to buy it from a, a company called GNIP, who um, is G-N-I-P, who are basically Twitter's data company. So we've had to now enter into a deal with GNIP in order to buy data and combine that with our own data. We're very fortunate in the sense that we already have a database of, I think, billions of articles now and their share count. So going forward, we'll use the GNIP data and then we'll continue to add shares we find from that to our current count. So we anticipate no real impact on us at all. We will carry on providing the Twitter shares for each article. It has cost us quite a bit of money to buy it from GNIP, so hopefully people appreciate it. But, um, but we'll just carry on as normal. But it's just so people are aware if you're using a, a free... Um, Twitter account button or something like that, that probably disappear next um, Friday unless that company is also buying the data as we are. So I hope that helps. Great. Well, thank you all for your time today. We appreciate it. We're glad um, glad you have had so many of you join us for the webinar. And if you have questions, you can tweet us at BuzzSumo. You can reach Steve, Steve at BuzzSumo.com and me, I'm Susan at BuzzSumo.com. So we're always happy to 
to talk with you, answer questions, and uh, just really grateful for your time today. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks. Yeah, great weekends, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.